morning everybody it's good to have you all aboard this morning we're looking forward a great great day we had a good weekend and uh, appreciate all of your prayers uh, uh, especially <coughs> I was able uh, to get through yesterday without too much difficulty and uh, do definitely appreciate your prayers it was so great day wonderful wonderful time together uh, we looked at a, a, a tough subject, but one that we really, really need to understand because, uh, you know, suffering is part and parcel of the human condition. And we need to see how God can use and what he may be doing through that so that when we do go through times of, uh, of, of, of suffering, whether it's physical or emotional, spiritual, you know, uh, outside pressures, all those kind of things, we know that God has a purpose behind it. We may not know the specific purpose, but we know how God wants to use it and use it in our lives, and that gives us an opportunity to pray and seek Him. So we had a good time yesterday. May God bless. And there is Miss Alyssa. I love the Bailey family. And uh, along with them would be young Cameron and Kara and Cody. Robbie was great to see him yesterday and visit with him and, and know the victories that God has given. You guys are so precious. We just really love you. You are just uh, just such a, 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 a sweet, sweet part of us. Thank you for being part. There is Daniel. Daniel, I love you. It is good to see you out there this morning and uh, to know that God is working greatly in your life. And uh, it's good to have you at Bible study. Betsy, uh, this is a lady who had to drive down for the day to see her granddaughter and go back because otherwise she would get the tremors and the shakes and everything else. And I don't blame her. That's quite a sweet baby. But uh, good to have you. Glad you made it home safely. And it's good to see you this morning. Miss Ruth, 
I pray you are doing well today and give Kenneth a hi to us. We love you. Miss Cynthia, I uh, love you too. It is good to see you this morning. Give a shout out to Mr. Ryan and uh, you know we love you guys. There's Miss Carolyn. Pray you had a good day yesterday, and it's good to see you up here this morning. God bless, sister. And Miss Terry, we give you the we'll give you the three highs. And there's Miss Sherry. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm going to give you an I love you too, dear. And there is Miss Sue. Sweet Miss Sue. It is good to see you there this morning. I love this crowd. I I, I love the, the the people who who, who sign I love the people who don't. I just like to know who everybody is out there. Uh, but at any rate, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and uh, uh, put this back up there and, and and begin because we start out in this chapter and I just kind of want to push everything from last week into a r real condensed form uh, because uh, we'll be picking up uh, Ruth and Carolyn. We missed you both yesterday. Yes, we did. Uh, at any rate, last week we looked. Uh, took our time to explore Jesus' view on marriage uh, and divorce. Of course, the topic was divorce, but Jesus turned it around and made the topic marriage because that's what you believe about marriage is going to determine uh, much about what you believe about divorce. In uh, the first, uh, starting in the second verse of chapter 10, said some Pharisees came up to Jesus testing him and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife. He answered them, what did uh, Moses command you? What does the scripture say? What, what, what does the law say? They said, well, Moses permitted uh, a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. But Jesus said to them, now, why did you do that? Let's go to the very foundation. Let's peel the onion layers back. Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them. So now he takes us back to the foundational principles of marriage. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and these two shall be one, one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, we attempted to follow Jesus' pattern in his response, and, and looked at the subject matter from, uh, uh, from the very foundational statement that is made concerning marriage from the very beginning, from the beginning of creation. And there is Miss Lena, and I'm uh, uh, assuming that uh, along with Miss Lena, we've got uh, Mr. Rick. We love the Stewart family. Good to see you this morning. They're in Vancouver, so uh, uh, we're reaching all the way across the river into Vancouver. Uh, but we're reaching further than that. Folks, uh, I'm going to throw a prayer request out to you because uh, right now, uh, because it has crossed my mind again. Uh, Pastor Sadich has talked to me several times about the persecution that goes on in their area of Christians. Uh, somebody had put a video montage together uh, just right around their area, just in the very next, you know, basically the next county, next state over from them. Uh, the the persecution that Christians are going through. I'd, I'd never show it to anybody. I won't show it to any of you. It's 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 very graphic. It depicts uh, burnings and and uh, uh, beatings, uh, uh, murder of of uh, Christians, of, of pastors, their families, of of, uh, of Christians with you know being surrounded by large groups of of, of Hindu men and women. Uh, and just being brutalized for their faith, you know, in the gospel and for preaching the gospel. So uh, that's, you know, that's what they're combating. That's what they're dealing with. So uh, I encourage you to to pray. Uh, they are part of, I, I, I subscribed for years to uh, the Voice of the Martyrs. If you don't, I think it would uh, do you well to go out and find it and, uh, uh, and get updates from them. Uh, but... Uh, <clears throat> They keep track of the persecuted church around the world, and uh, certainly this is right in their ballpark. I don't know who made, who made the montage, but uh, it's it, it, it can be disturbing. So uh, that's happening, people. That's happening to the church. That's happening to the body of believers. Certainly not right here, but but never kid yourself. I believe there's a good possibility that the day will come, even in this nation, that we can see that type of physical, all-out 
brutal persecution of the church. Uh, I pray uh, not, but uh, when I read scripture and I know what happens in the end times, uh, uh, anything is possible. So please uh, be in prayer for the persecuted church. And I would very particularly for those uh, in South India, uh, those where uh, Pastor Sadich is, uh, in those areas, some places in India are much safer. Uh, way down in South India, but uh, up in the area where where he's at, in the in the northern and and uh, eastern part of the the of the nation, it is brutal. When I was in India, and, and I got word some of the evangelists that we sent out, lay lay evangelists into those areas that went up. Some of them were were even killed. So this has been going on for 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 years and years and years. So. Well, I give that to you to pray. At any rate, uh, Jesus takes us back to that, uh, back to the beginning, and that's what we looked at, and we followed through with that to the end of the Old Testament. We begin with God's purpose in marriage, and we end, interestingly enough, in Malachi with that statement that God says, "I hate divorce." So we've gone a long way from God's intended purpose back here in Genesis till we get to the point that it's so prevalent and so rampant and so abusive in Israel that God makes that incredible statement, I hate divorce. He said, you have brought brutality, you have brought evil over the covering, over that, over that uh, uh, teleth, <laughs> that, <laughs> that garment that you placed over your wife and uh, you have defiled it and I hate that. So, you know, we looked at that. Then we, we looked at uh, the companion verses also in Matthew, uh, where we get the only exception clause that we find in the Gospels. In Matthew 19, in verse 9, that companion, uh, uh, there we go. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery, causes her to commit, because he, back in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus has made this statement as well. And it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorcement. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the cause of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So, you know, Jesus took a line uh, not unlike Pastor Shammai, only he took it from the basis of the law. And he drew, he drew all of his conclusions from the foundational uh, statement that, uh, about marriage. Uh, in, Mar in Matthew 5 and verse 31, Jesus is following Moses' dictate. His law given to him by God to give to the people because of the hardness of their hearts. In Deuteronomy 24, 1. When a man takes a wife, marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because uh, he has found some indecency in her. Now, if you remember, you know, uh, that had been twisted and perverted uh, to, to say, well, that meant even if he found a woman that was more favorable, that he was okay to divorce. You know, it, it had come down to that. But it's very specific, the word that is used there, indecency in her. And he writes her doesn't say he has to or is commanded to, but this is explanation. If he writes her a certificate of divorce, this is the reason for it. And he puts it in her hand and sends her forth from his house. Two key words, one in the Hebrew, one in the Greek, that cause us to understand exactly what's being said. In the Hebrew, it is cherva, uh, which is translated indecency. In the Greek, it's pornea. Uh, which translates immorality, unchastity, fornication, adultery. All right? A whole group of words that are based off of the root word pornea. It means that she, or he, if you will, has disgraceful. Now, we know in Hebrew culture, they couldn't, you know, a woman couldn't divorce, only the man could. Uh, but in Roman culture, it would be either. So that's why I'm adding the he or she. It means that she or he has disgracefully lowered themselves, exposing their nakedness to open shame, to uncleanness sexually. Uh, it, you know, so uh, the Greek word uh, includes such things as incest and sodomy, holotry, uh perversion, bestiality, all, all forms and sorts of sexual sin before or after marriage. Now, on the issue then, of divorce or remarriage, it all hangs on that word except. 
and, and what it means. And when a person, when we you and I hear the word accept, we immediately think of something that is not included. Okay, I, I used the illustration last week that you know every you know everybody's going to uh, uh, you know, go to hell except those who are born again, those who have accepted Christ. So there is an exception to the no divorce rule, and that is for sexual immorality. When a divorce is because of sexual immorality, the innocent party then is free to marry without any judgment over them. Uh, that covenant had been broken uh, because of uh, infidelity. We ended Friday by beginning to look at another exception. We <laughs> excuse me in Paul's <coughs> excuse me in Paul's letter to the Corinthian believers, and we'll come back to that after prayer. Let's see, Len is there. There's Therese. Good morning, Therese. It's good to see you. And there is Miss Jessica. Uh, your your mom's going to have to give a long distance kiss, and you'll have to catch it and give both of them to Miss Sadie. Pray for Miss Sadie. She is not out of the woods. She's still having some some tongue issues, some muscular issues that uh, they got to figure out how to strengthen and stuff. So uh, be be in prayer. Keep keep Sadie in in your prayers. And by the way, all the way up there. Let's see. Uh, I know uh, Daniel's at work, so when you get home, you make sure that. Uh, uh, that three uh, that uh, uh, Athena gets one on each side as well. Let's pray, Father. I thank you. I thank you for the joy of this family. I thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to put us together. God, we know that we live in dangerous and brave times. Paul tells us that in the last of. Uh, the days before you return, that that's how you could describe it. Depraved, uh, uh, deceived, and, uh, and dangerous. I think of the, the communication that I've had with Pastor Sadich, and, and I think, Lord, that uh, what they go through in, in, in their world is so much different than what we go through. I think of what we talked about in suffering. And God, sometimes we as believers here in America, we call what we do and as, as persecution, spiritual warfare comes down on us and suffering. And it is. Not to minimize that, Lord. But when I see the brutality, the martyrdom that takes place in other parts of the world, simply because somebody would stand and, and, and uh, stand for the truth and profess Christ, God, I begin to realize we're not living that far from the first century. When and then that first and second and even into the third century, Lord, there was brutal, brutal persecution of the church. And to know that that's still going on in, in large portions of our world. God, I pray that you will protect them, those that are in those positions. I think of how many have been martyred in Afghanistan, preachers who have been uh, uh, brutally, brutally murdered along with their families simply because they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, truly your word is truth when it tells us that, uh, that in this life we will have tribulation because they hate you they will in turn hate us. But Lord, give courage and strength to your church to stand in the midst of it all, defending the faith, even to the point that it would cost us dearly. Father, I pray that you take what we're studying today Give each of us the wisdom that we need, as we looked at yesterday, to look at all the pieces of this puzzle and have the wisdom to then apply them to our own life and the courage to exercise them until they become a skill within us to where we can be marked as those who walk in wisdom. God, I love you. And I pray now, Lord, that you just simply open up to us the word of truth 
Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go ahead and launch in further. You know, the, the question was, is divorce permitted in Scripture for anything other than sexual impurity? And uh, you, we do see, we see provision made uh, in, in two areas in Paul's letter. First, Paul gives instructions to, to, uh, to marry you know, Christian that are married, a Christian to a Christian. In 1 Corinthians 7, which is a marriage chapter for Paul, you know, he, he tells us, he said, it's, 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 it's better that you stay single, perhaps, for the sake of the gospel, but, you know, uh, but that's not for everybody. Singleness is, is a calling, I believe, uh, because uh, God has given us marriage to, uh, to complete us, to, to make that, that uh, uh, to what I'm, I'm complete because of, in, in many ways, because of my union, you know, with my wife. But anyway, in 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11, it says, But if the married, uh, but to the married I give instruction, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, there is a caveat here. Let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not send his wife away. Now here we have two Christian people married to one another. Paul simply says, stay together. You'll work it out. There's no reason to leave. If if, if there's sexual uh, immorality, you know, uh, you know, that's one thing. But if there is none, then stay together. Learn to work your problems out, basically. Now, it's interesting that he does make provision for separation. And here I want to be very clear to everybody because uh, we have been accused when, when we say these things and say, well, you, you just want a woman to stay there and get beat half to death. No. No, folks, I, I, I don't, I, I violently oppose that sort of thing. Uh, in fact, the Bible does not anywhere teach that a wife has any obligation to stay in a home with an abusive husband, an abusive man who threatens her physical welfare or the physical welfare of her children. All it says is if she does leave under those circumstances that she either be reconciled to the husband, you know, get the help that needed so they can come back together or remain unmarried. The only biblical reason that we're given for two Christians divorcing is sexual immorality. Uh, I have found, though, and, and just to be very honest, in, in my nearly 50 years of working with people, I haven't had all that many cases where there was physical abuse, that there wasn't also uh, immoral activity going on, just to be very honest with you. Uh, that's That's been my experience. It may not be somebody else's, but over working with hundreds and hundreds of families over the last 48 years, I can tell you the vast majority when I find abuse in the home, when you start peeling things back, you're going to find there is infidelity going on as well. Uh, so second though, Paul also addresses a mixed marriage where a Christian is married to an unbeliever. And that happens in a lot of ways. A lot of times, you know, when two non-believers get married, then a spouse <laughs> gets saved in, in my family. Uh, my dad was not a Christian. My mom was not a Christian. She got saved years after, after they had kids. So there was a point in time where they were unequally yoked. Uh, but she took everything that it took until my dad was saved, you know, and they stayed together. Uh, other times, it, you know, a Christian will marry a non-Christian. And, you know, in that case, they are unequally yoked, uh, regardless, you know, of anything else. But here's the instruction that Paul gives us in verses 12 through 15. But to the rest I say, not I, uh, not, you know, not, uh, I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, let him not send her away. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, let her not send him away. Remember, we're speaking not only to Jews, but to Greeks and, and to Romans as well. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through the believing husband. For otherwise, your children would be unclean. But now they are holy. They're set apart. 
Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother's sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. And teaching here is quite simple. Paul is well familiar with the teaching of Jesus, and he, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, expands the exception from sexual immorality to include desertion by an unbelieving partner. He says that if you're a believer uh, married to an unbeliever, stay with them. God may save them. Uh, he holds out hope that that could happen. In verse 16, he says, For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Now, she doesn't do the saving. But staying there, praying for him, witnessing to him, you know, God is extending a measure of grace. Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Husband stays in the marriage, and he loves the wife and serves her, and is a Christian husband and prays for her and witnesses to her. And we have seen this. We have seen this beautifully, beautifully happen, you know, in families. We've seen husbands saved because the uh, believing wife has, has hung in there and loved them. I saw that in my own family with my dad. We've seen it in, in others where husbands have stayed faithful and loved their wives and served them and minister them, witness them, and see those wives come to faith in Christ. Uh, Tony's a good example of that, and I'll you know just throw that. So we, we see that. In other words, he's saying God may do something. Stay with them as long as they desire to stay with you. In verse 15, he gives us the only other biblical grounds for divorce. When the unbelieving partner leaves a believer, the believer is to let that unbeliever go. Scripture says that the brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Bondage to what? Well, obviously, bondage to the law of marriage. Uh, let's take a look at that. In, in, in Romans chapter 7, <coughs> This is your primer on marriage, I guess. But it says, For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So, you know, this, this covenant union that we come into. Now understand that uh, uh, when an unbeliever marries a, a, a non-believer, uh, that covenant, you know, it's, it, it's, remember the tension that we're talking about, only one part of that union can uh, can reach out and connect to God until the other one is saved. Uh, so Paul speaks of being released from the bondage of marriage uh, by the desertion or the leaving of the unbelieving partner. Now what scripture is teaching here is that Christians should stay with those non-Christian husbands or wives as long as that non-Christian is willing. But if that non-Christian leaves uh, the Christian and divorces him or her, <laughs> The Christian is released from that marriage, biblically, and free to remarry. Uh, well, to sum up, there are only three things that biblically release a marriage partner from marriage. The death of, of the one married partner, sexual unfaithfulness by a marriage partner, and desertion and divorce by an unbelieving married partner. Uh, that's as plain as scripture can give it. I've worked with a lot of people over the years, and I can tell you that uh, this is the groundwork that is laid, uh, that, that, that we have when, when going into marriage. Understand the very foundation. Buy for yourself that foundational statement and make that the basis on which you are going to build your life. And as you do, stay faithful to it. Both partners working together under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, it is the most beautiful thing God has given a man and a woman. And I want to make clear what Jesus said. Divorce is a sin. No ifs, no ands, no buts about it. It's a sin. Um, but I also want you to keep in mind that it is not an unpardonable sin. Like all sin, with the exception of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, it is forgivable. Okay? Now, I, I, I want to make that clear. Because when I grew up, and in the churches I grew up in, 
if someone, oh, you know, you'd hear the whispering that they're divorced. <laughs> and they were relegated to second tier, third tier, fourth tier status within the church. Is it any wonder that so many people flooded out of the church when, when that sort of thing happened? Because they really weren't welcome. They were a taint. They were a blemish. Instead of embracing each person for where they are. We would, you know, it, the funny thing is, when I was a kid, I, I, I remember people who had been in, in, in trouble with the law and uh, uh, they'd gotten saved and they had these, and they'd bring them up and they'd, they'd parade them on the platform and everybody would applaud this, this lawbreaker up there who got saved. And if somebody, you know, you know, just about you know anything you can think of, you can have a guy that is a recovering alcoholic, everybody, yay, yay. You know, he was a drunkard, but he's saved and he's sober now. We celebrate, and we should. And on and on it go. But I can tell you one thing. They never paraded a divorced person up who got divorced, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and say, yay. Yay, because God had restored them. You just never saw it. No people. At some point we have to realize that each and every single case rises and falls on itself. We don't put and lump everything into one little basket and say, all right, if, if you're, divorced, you're in this basket regardless you know, of the situation or the circumstance. I don't want us to go all the way over where we say, hey, anything goes. No. But understand, every person is an individual. And each individual must be looked at and loved on the basis of who that person is. One last word on the subject and we'll move on. Take a look at Mark 10 in verse 9. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And I guess the question that I would put out there, what role does God have in the marriage between two unbelievers? Two people who have no relationship with Christ. Has God joined them together? Think about that. What about the person long before they get married? They were married and divorced, perhaps married and divorced again. They get saved somewhere down the line. And now they're in a Christian marriage. Do we run that person out or put them in a corner? Well, think about that. And I'll leave it to you to come to your conclusions based upon a firm understanding of Scripture. Teresa, good morning to you. It is good to see you <coughs> up there. The screen didn't scroll up, so I didn't see you come in. Bottom line is, divorce is a violation of God's intention for marriage. <coughs> My good friend Michael, it's good to see you this morning. Enjoyed visiting with you, my friend. Love you. So, it always is, always involves some sort of sin. Remember, God's design from creation was one man, one woman in, in a covenant union together for the rest of their life, or unless one passes away. Anyone who has been through a divorce knows the incredible pain and heartache that it brings. It's not merely a, a eradicating of a legal contract. It is a tearing apart of two people who have become one, and there is tremendous pain and suffering when that happens. But remember the larger context in which Mark gives us this teaching. That larger context, look at, at, at chapter 9, verse 35. And sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, let him be last and a servant of all. This is the context at which this is spoken. Jesus is saying that uh, greatness is about being a servant. Greatness is about being first. It's about being last and a servant of all. From Jesus' perspective, a great person puts everyone else before himself and takes on the role of a servant. Now, if we do this in our marriages, 
I don't think divorce will ever be an issue because marriage will be great. If the husband will simply take on a role as the servant to the wife, and if a wife will take on the role as a servant to the husband, folks, that's bliss. That truly, truly is bliss. It is, it, it is uh, uh, the kingdom at its best. And when parents serve children, children serve parents. When everybody in a family is bending over and they're, they're, they're tripping over themselves to serve the other, what a blessing. As the Lord finishes his comments about marriage, some of the local people begin to approach the home where, where he's at. Of course, they get in a home and the disciples come and gather around him and they're asking for more clarification. They figure out where he is and, and, and the crowds begin to come and uh, approach him with their children, seeking the Lord to bless the little ones. And I, I, I don't believe it's coincidental that the story about the children follows in each of the Gospels, the, uh, uh, the synoptics, the teaching on marriage. Can it be that when Jesus held a very high view of the sanctity of marriage, the people concluded that he so highly esteemed the family that they were uh, thus encouraged by his words to bring their children to him to bless them. Now, in our text, uh, in, in, in verses 13 through 31 of Mark 10, contains two major paragraphs describing two separate but related incidences. The first paragraph is verses 13 through 16 and contains Mark's description of the Lord's response to the disciples as they attempted to hinder the parents bringing their children to Jesus so that he would touch them and pray for them and thus bless them. Kind of like what we, we saw a couple you know, weeks ago you know, when we dedicated and, 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 and prayed a blessing over uh, uh, Sadie. We'll be doing the same thing in the next couple of weeks with uh, Athena. It is a sweet time. Now, the second paragraph in this section contains an incident with a rich young ruler who came to Jesus to learn what he might do to obtain eternal life, along with the response that Jesus uh, of Jesus and his disciples. All right? There is, I believe, a clear thread of continuity that ties these two paragraphs together. In, in the first place, all three Gospels include both incidences, both of which are found together in each gospel in the same order. Second, both paragraphs deal with how men enter into the kingdom of God. In the first paragraph, childlikeness is an essential element, and in the second paragraph, being rich is a hindrance. Hmm. Now, does it mean rich people can't get saved? No. You'll have to wait till we get that section as we pull that apart. But sometimes the more stuff we got, the more stuff is in the way of coming to Christ. All right? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at this first paragraph. In Mark 10, uh, enter, let's see. Uh, yeah. Entering the kingdom like a child. That's what this first paragraph is all about. And they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, and I don't think in an overly too kindly way, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter in it at all. And he took them in his arms, and he began blessing them and laying his hands on them. All right, now we begin our exploration of this marvelous, marvelous paragraph. Verse 13 and 14. And they were bringing their children to him so he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Who are the they? Who are bringing the children to Jesus? Well, 
there is the automatic presumption that it's mothers bringing their children to the Lord. However, that might not be the whole story. The they, as they were bringing their children to him, is in the is a masculine pronoun, plural pronoun, indicating that it was the fathers who instigated the bringing of the children to Jesus. Now, this was part of the Jewish tradition, to bring a child to, to a rabbi that he might bless them. And the tradition is said to date all the way back to Genesis 48, verses 14 through 16, where Jacob blessed his grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons, by laying his hands on their head. Now, the word bringing is prospero, uh, prospero which means it's much stronger than the simple word to bring. This is an intense form <clears throat> and was commonly used for the bringing of sacrifices. And here it, it, it suggests the idea of a dedication. I remember we had a dedication service where we were committing you know, we, we don't, that didn't sanctify you know, a little saint. It won't Tina. But what it is, it says this is a family dedicating this child to God. Like when Hannah brought Samuel and gave him up to the Lord. Uh, we're going to have to close here. But, but I leave you with that thought. Think of the fact that these fathers are bringing their children. Now, I think the mothers come along. But the emphasis here is that the initiative is taken by the father to bring their children to the Lord, present them to him for his blessing. Think about all the ramifications that we'll pick up on this tomorrow and try to flesh this out more deeply. I pray that you have enjoyed what you have heard. Uh, we're getting into some, some really great territory now as it relates to the kingdom. And remember, when we get over to chapter 11, we move into that last week, his last trip to Jerusalem before his crucifixion. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the joy of fellowship with my brothers and sisters here every morning. I thank you, Lord, that your word can be opened up and, uh, and understood. I thank you, Lord, that you give us the wisdom to apply these words to our life. And I pray, Lord, that we do, that we evaluate our life based upon the word of God. Lord, you gave us the word for instruction. You gave it to us for correction and reproof and training in righteousness, that we would be a people who are thoroughly furnished for all the work that you've given us to do. That's the purpose here. So, Lord, let us ask, what are you teaching me? Where do I need to be corrected? Are you training me, Lord, for something in the future? And, and then apply those principles to our life. God, I thank you. I, I, I love you. And I, I'm thinking right now of, of Rosa and, uh, and uh, Isaac and Joram as in the next couple of weeks, Rosa will be down there this week and uh, the boys are going to follow her and lead in Vacation Bible School there in Rosarita, Baja, California with Pastor Raphael. We lift that up. We pray now, Lord, that doors will be starting to fling open in that area and that, Lord, it will be more surprising than they ever could have imagined. And, God, we will see many, many children and their parents brought to faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, we just ask you to take us through this day and use us as vessels, as instruments of righteousness in the hands of of Almighty God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Sherry says, family committing themselves to raise their children to know the truth about God. That's exactly right. And it's not just family. It's, it's moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, uh, great-grandma and great-grandpa, uh, whole church full of people saying, hey, we're taking on the responsibility of training this child up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But it all starts in the family. God bless you. Listen, see you in the morning at nine. and We'll pick up here and move on forward. God bless you all.